morning, everyone. We want to welcome everyone to our worship service today, both every, everyone here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us online. We are glad you joined with us for worship. Uh, as always, we start our worship service with a scripture reading. For today's reading, I would like to invite your attention to Psalm 111, Psalm 111. I will read it. Uh, please feel free to join along as we read it aloud. Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in equalness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. This is a psalm of praise, as you can see, an, ex an exhortation and an encouragement to worship the Lord. Why should we praise the Lord? Uh, I think praise and worship is, uh, is a natural response when we begin to see the glory and the majesty of the Lord. Um, when we see some of the natural wonders that God has created, like the Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon, we would say, wow, this is amazing. And if it is so, and but when it comes to worshiping God, if we find ourselves asking this question, why should we praise God? I think part of the reason, it may be that we haven't fully understood or our understanding of the glory and majesty of God is very limited and shallow. I think we worship God primarily for who he is and uh, secondly for what he has done. And, and this psalm especially, it focuses on the latter part, the greatness of his work. Verse 2, it says, uh, great are the works of the Lord. And again in verse 3, it says, glorious and majestic are his deeds. Uh, beginning with that, the psalmist goes on to describe a, a list of reasons, a list of things that describe the greatness of the work of the Lord. But before he does that, he gives a couple of insights into the manner of his worship. If you look at uh, verse 1, it says, I will extol the Lord with all my heart. Um, I think God cannot be acceptably praised with a divided heart. Why is that? Even, even when we bring our best, even when we bring our whole heart into worship, I think it is too little for the glory of God. If that is so, can you imagine if we come with a divided heart, if we come with a half-hearted uh, heart before God, it is actually not honoring God. It is actually an insult to God when we come half-heartedly for worship. And half-hearted worship is not worthy of the God of all creation. So that is why the scripture always encourages us to bring our, our best before him. Be it the sacrifices of the Old Testament or our worship under the New Covenant, we are to bring our best. We are to come with our whole heart before God. And secondly, it goes on to say that um, in the council of the upright and assembly, not only, not only is his worship uh, with a whole heart, but it is also very public. It, it is important for us to have our private altar where we worship God at our, in the quietness of our hearts. But I think the scripture also consistently encourages us to express our worship publicly. And when we come together in this manner for worship, we can be sure that we are following the pattern of the scripture, both in the Old Testament and New Testament, believers gathered for public worship. And, and the psalmist goes on to describe several of God's works for his people. And we won't have time to go through those. But one thing uh, in verse that we read in verse 4 struck me 
He says he has caused his wonders to be remembered. And we have a tendency to forget what God has done for us. But it says here, God has intended them to be remembered. As we uh, begin our worship today, we can ask ourselves, I think we can ask ourselves this question, what has God done in our lives? And it goes on to say many things. I'll just touch upon some of them. Verse 4, it says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate. I'm sure most of us have experienced this mercy in our lives. Verse 5, he provides food for those who fear, those who fear him. He is the source and of all the provisions that we enjoy. And verse 9, it says, he provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. I think of all the blessings that we enjoy from God, the gift of salvation is what we should be most thankful for. I think that is what makes it possible for us to come together in this manner. He redeemed us from a state of despair, from a state of hopelessness and gave us a sure hope and a future. So as we come before him, let us think what he has done for us in our lives personally and let's uh, uh, come with uh, our whole hearts to worship him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this Sunday morning. Thank you for this time of worship that you gave us. We come before you with humble hearts. We thank, come before you with grateful hearts, Lord, remembering how great you are, Lord. Thank you. We worship you, Lord. We honor you. We take this time to give you honor and respect, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in our lives, Lord. When we think of the creation, when we, when we think of all that you have made, the moon and the sun and the stars and everything, Lord, what are we that we, but you have considered us, Lord, and you remember us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for all your provisions and above all, Lord, we thank you for giving us this access to come before your throne of grace and call you Abba, Father, Lord. We remember the cross at this time. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for the redemption, Lord. Thank you that you sacrificed yourself to make it possible for us to come before you, Lord. Lord, as we spend this time in your presence, Lord, help us to set our minds completely on you and focus on you and give you our undivided attention to glorify you, Lord. Lord, we pray that our thoughts, our meditation of our heart would be acceptable in your sight. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. We ask everything in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, church. Uh, let's praise God this morning. This afternoon, sorry. Um, and as we continue in, in worship, um, we just heard um, giving a half-hearted worship. And I was just thinking about these songs that we're singing. And, and, and when I was thinking to myself, I was like, let's look deeper than the songs. I mean, God doesn't really need any of these external offerings. He only asks the worship from our heart. Um, I, I heard this one time, our songs can always be better. The music can always be better. The sermons can always be better but there's nothing better than the worship that we get, that, that God gets from our heart. And that's the best kind of worship. Uh, it's the one that comes from within. So let's tune our hearts uh, this afternoon as we sing these songs. Um, God only requires what's, what's inside. Um, so yeah, please stand, rise to your feet, and uh, we'll sing these songs together. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Oh, my soul, I worship his holy name. We'll sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship his holy name. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. And bless. 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. We'll sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Your you're slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. We sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come and still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever And bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. We'll sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, and bless the Lord, oh my soul. holy name we'll sing like never before oh my soul I worship your holy name I will worship your holy name I will worship your holy give life you are love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken let's sing this together great are you Lord you give life you give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give up, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you Lord you get life I love you bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every
every heart that is broken we sin great are you lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only great are you lord and all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great are you lord all the earth will shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing great
God, we ask uh, that you prepare our hearts to receive and study your word. Lord, let us sit in anticipation, in waiting for your instructions, Lord, and ultimately that we walk stronger in your way, we walk stronger in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord and good morning. In this beautiful Sunday morning, we welcome you in the sanctuary to the presence of our Lord. Welcome to all those watching online. We pray that you will join us for worshiping our Lord. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. Anyone visiting us for the first time? If there is anyone, please raise your hands. We can recognize you and welcome you. Thank you. Our weekly schedules and meetings are continuing on Zoom. Our weekly prayers are on Wednesday 7.30. Please join us and be blessed as a family. Our Friday morning fellowship is at 10.30 in the morning. Please join us. Together we can intercede for the needs of our people. The journey groups continues on Tuesdays and Fridays. The group leaders will uh, give you the details. So the focus group meeting on Saturdays, your leaders will reach out to you. Sunday morning we have the SOAR at 9 a.m. Please sign on your children and join the classes. We have an announcement from SOAR. Dear SOAR Hawks parents and students, for, you, for our Youth Sunday next week, all the Hawks students have been requested to record and submit a short video which will be played during the service. See the email sent last week for details. Please contact Noble and Betsy if you have any questions. Giving. Luke 6, 38 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Thank you for your online giving. Uh, also here, after the message is completed, we'll be accepting the offerings. And this morning, we are going to hear the word from Dr. Mason Lingastro. 
He is giving the message from Psalm 44 on a theme, the place of suffering in the Christian life. We pray that God's anointing will be upon him and pray God will open our heart to listen his words. May God bless you. Before the message, first we want to give us some information about our missions in India. Thank you. Thank you, Sharjan. Thank you so much. Welcome all of you. We are good to be back in the house of the Lord. We are excited to come together uh, to worship. And we welcome everyone, those who are online also, again uh, for this uh, joyous day as we gather together. You know, as we heard uh, initially as we are reading from uh, God's word, that God's marvelous works, you know, that is, uh, our worship is a response to God's marvelous works. And as God's children, as we say that uh, uh, as part of God's church, you know, as the body of Christ, we said our purpose, our mission is to love God, to love one another and share his love. And everything that we do is to accomplish that mission. That's what we do. You know, our worship is our response, our expression to the love towards God. That's what we do. That's what we sing. We praise, you know, for my, God's mercy and compassion towards us. So we want to love him with all our heart. And other areas that we do is to prayer. We depend upon God and we express again our love towards God through our dependence upon Him. And our discipleship, all the activities, our uh, journey groups, our uh, focus group, you know, all the things that we do is to, to learn God's Word, to grow and to become like Jesus Christ. So that is our discipleship. The other area is our fellowship, to have a relationship with one another. We are not just a group of people to come and go. Uh, we said these things again and again. It's not a cliche. Church is not a place we go, but a people we belong. So we want to get to know each other. Sunday is the only time we are able to come together. So this is a post-pandemic world. Things are very different and uh, people are with different levels of comfort zones in each one of us, as we all know that. And obviously, those reasons are right also. Uh, but we encourage you, you know, again to stay back for a little more time, as usually we do, because fellowship is as sacred as worship. So I know that you are busy and we all are things, but don't rush out and try to talk to each other. So foyer is a place is more, you know, contagious there. So please don't stay there. The fellowship hall is open. You can go there. We leave the doors also open. It will be safe. And there is no food, so you don't have to be obligated to eat anything else. But you can be there. And so we just keep on saying this. And instead of standing outside in the sun, and uh, you can sit there and talk and share uh, and uh, talk to each other. So please make sure you do that. That is one thing we can do. So we can slowly start all these things back to our normal rhythms and schedules. Other area is that we do is missions. So worship, prayer, discipleship, fellowship, and mission. Those are the five areas we try to accomplish the mission to love God, to love one another, and share his love. So we are privileged to be uh, partners in the gospel with the many of the faithful servants, those who minister in India. There is thousands of ministries is there, and there is obviously, there is a lot of needs are in our country, as you all know that. So what do we do? How we are able to do it? From the inception of this church, it was our desire, is always want to be a blessing in the ministry that happens in India. That is what, we are not able to go there, but we know the needs are there than anyone else. So we should have the burden for our land, and we have to pray. And we have from eight different uh, language groups and different states, you all represented here. So we can be a small uh, a blessing to the ministry in India. That's what we do. So uh, last uh, several years, by God's grace and with your prayer and sacrificial giving and support, we are able to, uh, to support uh, four or five different states in India. So we have been doing ministry in Odisha, in Jharkhand, in West Bengal, in Assam, and a few times we were able to do in Karnataka. Now we are extending that to Nagaland also. So we have a ministry and a missionary there, uh, Pastor Anil, and he's running an uh, orphanage there. So the elders met and the needs that we, uh, we connected with him through Sam. And so we are try starting helping him this month onwards. So again, thank you for your faithful supports. You have read the uh, mission report from Pastor John Mathai. You know, the marvelous things the Lord is doing, you know, through our prayers and support. Even though things are very difficult, but in the midst of that, God is still at work. The gospel is at work. God is tra transforming and changing lives. When we hear that, that is one of the greatest fulfillment for me. When I see that, you know, those things are helping. It's small things, but through that small thing, lives are being changed. 
And uh, I got a, a text the other day also from Assam. There are five different people got baptized also this month. So let's thank the Lord for, uh, for what God is doing. And we really want to appreciate every third week is our mission Sunday. And there is, a, you know, you can write your checks and designate it to mission that will go, uh, solely go to the needs of the mission field. And again, thank you for your faithful support for that also. Continue to pray for John Angle's brother. He is taken back to the hospital again, and he is in a critical condition. So pray that look like he had a stroke. That is what Uncle told. So please remember him in your prayers. Uncle and Andy is on the way back here home. So please remember him also in your prayers. And this morning again, we are privileged to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Mason Lancaster, and Susie is with us. Welcome them, and we are going to hear from God's word. Would you please welcome Dr. Mason as he come and bring God's word to us this morning? Morning, ICF. Good morning, ICF. Good morning. <laughs> oh, that's loud. Um, it's good to be with you this morning. I am thankful for this opportunity uh, to share with you from God's Word. Um, many of you uh, know kind of our story. Uh, that is, my, my wife Susie and I, um, in 2000. 10, uh, I came back from overseas, it, in India actually. Uh, I had lived there for a short time and so I had left my job to go over there. When I came back, um, I came back to a blank slate, right, because I had left my job to go to India. Came back, didn't have a job, and, and I was meeting with my pastor at the time, uh, and we were discussing kind of what was next. And he just asked me a simple question. He said, if hypothetically someone gave you a year's salary, and you didn't have to worry about what to do to make money, what would you do? And I said, I would teach the Bible. And he said, okay, so you, next step, go to seminary. So that's what we did. So we spent the last 10 years, Susie and I, kind of traipsing around the country, following God to different cities and getting different degrees and whatever, so that I could be well-equipped to preach faithfully and teach faithfully from the scriptures. And there were hardships along the way, right? I mean. Many of you know, you move to a new place, you don't know anyone, it's hard to find a church, a family, friends, sense of belonging. We did a few different jobs along the way, there were plenty of unknowns. And then uh, we came back to San Diego, uh, what, a year and a half ago? Right when the pandemic hit. <laughs> and uh, it is an understatement to say that life has not gone as we planned since then. <laughs> I'm sure that's the case for many, many of us here. Uh, there were all kinds of surprises and detours, especially in the last year and a half. And it's been hard. Um, you know, I mean, we have much to be thankful for, right? Our, our challenges for, the, for our family are, are relatively small. We have our health, and we have family, and we have a home. We have much to be thankful for. But there have also been challenges. Uh, it's been a hard year and a half, at least, uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, to this trajectory that we've been following for 10 years, and here I am, I, I do have a part-time job teaching at Point Loma as a professor of Old Testament, and I'm thankful for that. Um, I have opportunities to teach in other places, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but you know, we left school thinking full-time professor position or, or working in a church or something, and that's not where we're at. That's not what God has for us in this season. And I know for many of you, there have been lots of challenges, especially over this last year and a half. Whether that's uh, work for you, wanting a, a different job, or a job at all, or a better job, or relationship statuses, right? Searching for a life partner, or visa, or family. I know there have been some of us that have lost family to COVID in the last year and a half. So we all have had our share of challenges, amen? Amen? So because of, uh, you know, this being challenging, and, and a few weeks ago I was particularly discouraged. And so I decided to take kind of a long morning, half day, kind of a way to pray, to read the scriptures, to journal, to reflect about what God is doing in all of this and what's God asking of us in the midst of this. Um, and I just happened to read, kind of, you know, I just flipped open my Bible to the next chapter, right? I had read Psalm 43 before, and so now it's time to read Psalm 44. It was not random, but it was just in order. I, hadn't, I didn't remember anything about Psalm 44 before this morning. 
But the Lord spoke to me through Psalm 44, and I really resonated with the psalm, found it encouraging. And so um, I'd like to share with you this morning from Psalm 44 uh, about what I found there, what the Lord spoke to me there. Also, uh, because of that, this morning's message is going to be a little bit different than usual. Uh, it's going to be kind of part testimony, part teaching, so kind of a mix. Um, and also, usually I prefer to focus on one passage, uh, but we're going to focus mostly on Psalm 44, but we're also going to go to some other passages. So just a heads up, a little bit unusual this morning. What we'll find in this psalm, in Psalm 44, you're welcome to open there if you would like. What we're going to find in Psalm 44 is that we are taken on a journey across the psalm, from beginning to end of the psalm. And this journey that we will go through the psalm is the same journey that we find within the whole Old Testament from beginning to end, and even within the whole Bible. And it's also the journey that each one of us is invited to take in our own lives of faith. It's the journey of how we respond to suffering or hardship in life. So join me in a word of prayer, and then we will turn to Psalm 44. Lord, we, um, we come before you. God, we love you. And we are in need. We bring uh, into this space dozens, hundreds of needs, of challenges, Lord. We are seeking to be faithful in the midst of all of these things. But there's so many unknowns. There's so many detours. There's so many hardships which we bring before you today, Lord. But we come nonetheless because we seek to be faithful and we love you and we want to hear a word from you, Lord. So would you speak from Psalm 44 to us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll, I'll be reading from uh, the ESV translation. As we begin reading Psalm 44, what we find to start off with is the psalmist basically shares a history lesson. The psalmist is remembering the past. So we read in verse 1 to 3. O oh God, we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hand, drove out the nations, and them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them, but your right hand and your arm in the light of your face, for you delighted in them. So the psalmist is remembering the Exodus, right? When their large family, their nation of Israel, was rescued out of slavery in Egypt and planted in the Promised Land, and God did that for them. But is the psalmist just giving a history lesson because he likes history? No. We see in the next verse that the psalmist is remembering the past for the sake of the future. In verse 4, we come across the prayer. There are really only two basic prayers in this whole psalm, and this is one of them. In verse 4, we read, You are my king, O God. Ordain salvation for Jacob. So here's where we're getting at. The psalmist has just recounted history because there's a problem now. And he's got a request for God to deal with this problem now, and he's remembering the past to give him faith for this present problem and how God will deal with it in the future. He's remembering the past for the sake of the future. In verse 4, you're, if you're reading from the NIV translation, it might say something like, you command salvation for Israel or Jacob. That would be a description, right? If the psalmist says, you God command salvation, that's a statement of what God does or has done. But the actual original Hebrew is not a statement about what God does. It's a command. Right? The psalmist is saying to God, command deliverance, command salvation, ordain rescue for us. The, God is, the psalmist is telling God what to do as a prayer. And the word salvation here doesn't mean mainly spiritual salvation. What we're going to see in the next few verses is there are military battles. The nation of Israel is at war, and perhaps has already been exiled. And so this psalmist is, is asking God, 
Would you please grant, command, ordain, rescue, deliverance, salvation for us now? In the next few verses, verses 5 to 8, he goes on, mostly recounting how God has done this in the past. So again, remembering the past for the sake of the future. Verse 5, through you we push down our foes, through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name. But in verse, well, the psalmist remembers the past for the sake of the future, right? And this is the first thing that we can learn from this psalm when it comes to our own journey of suffering or hardship in life, right? I have no idea what comes next for us. The future is opaque, right? I cannot see the future. Just say a random tangent that I wasn't planning on saying. We always, we talk about moving through time in terms of moving forward, right? We look forward to the future and the past is behind us. That's how we talk about it in English. There's a tribe in South America that talks about it the other way. They talk about moving, walking backwards. Because you can't see what's in the future, but you can see what's in the past, right? So similarly, I have no idea what's in the future. I can't see it. It's opaque. But hindsight is 2020. And when I look back, I see all the ways that God provided for us. The so many times where there was a challenge, an unknown, a hurdle, a hardship, and God provided a way, right? I spent eight years in graduate school, every minute that I was in grad school was paid for. And we even got extra scholarships, so I was paid to go to school. <laughs> right? We went, we went over there thinking, how are we going to pay for grad school? And every year we got scholarships. We wondered, are we going to find a family of faith like what we've had before? Every time we found a family of faith. We have lifelong friends all across the country. Right? We found places to live, right? apartments in which to live, different jobs that have enriched our lives in significant ways. We've made family along the way. There have been so many ways that God has provided in the past. And so like the psalmist in these first eight verses, we too are invited to remember the past for the sake of the future. Right? The future may be opaque, but hindsight is twenty twenty. In verse 9, we learn a little bit more about the psalmist's present, right? In verse 4, he said, ordain salvation for Jacob. Or basically that means come and rescue us. In verse 9, we read more. You've been good to us in the past, but, verse 9, but you have rejected us and disgraced us. You have not gone out with our armies. What we find in this next section is that things have not gone as expected for Israel, right? Just like perhaps for you and me, especially over this last year and a half, but maybe longer, life has not gone as expected. You have rejected us and disgraced us and not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe, and those who hate us have gotten spoil, right? Or they've taken all our stuff. You have made us like sheep for slaughter and have scattered us among the nations. You've sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughingstock among the peoples. All day long my disgrace is before me and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and the reviler, at the sight of the enemy and the avenger. Things have not gone as Israel expected. Right? God promised to be with them, with their armies, to fight on their behalf, and that has not happened.
particularly looking at verses 13 and 14 and 15. 13, 14, 15. I have, over the last year, started to resonate, more, understand more and more when different psalms talk about, let me not be put to shame. Right? One could be ashamed of not having the job that one expected or the house that one expected or the family situation that one expected, right? Maybe we're, we could be ashamed within ourselves or other people in our community could make us feel ashamed. And yet when the psalmist, not here, but regularly cries out, let me not be put to shame, right? Part of the reason is because we have, as believers, hitched our wagon to this God of the Bible, right? We've signed up to follow this God. We staked our lives on being obedient to the Lord. And now it seems that things have not gone as expected. It seems that things have not worked out. Did we make a big mistake in following the Lord? Because it hasn't worked out. For some of us, we might be the only Christians in our family, or one of a few Christians in our family, right? And whenever thing, life doesn't go quite the way that we or our families think it should, those around us may feel very free to point out, <laughs> you know, you became a Christian, how's that working for you? You ready to stop yet? I have friends uh, and family, peers, well, friends, peers, you know, that took a, a different life trajectory, and now they've got big houses, million-dollar houses, and stable salary, and, and things seem to be going well for them, right? Did I make a mistake following God around the country, trying to prepare for, for faithful ministry? When I think about these things, I think of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. The Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection and why the resurrection matters. And in verse 19, he says this, If in Christ we have hoped in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. What he means is if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, if Jesus isn't alive right now, if this life is all we have too, and we have only become Christians for the sake of what we get out of this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. Because to follow Jesus in this life will often mean hardship, challenge, detour, struggle, unknowns, surprises, unmet expectations. And if all we're hoping on is that this life works out well for us and that we get what we want out of this life and that it's comfortable and easy and successful in the eyes of the world, we will utterly fail at that and be most to be pitied in the world. But the whole point of 1 Corinthians 15 is that Christ did raise from the dead. And so this life is not all that we have to hope in. We do, in fact, hope in a living God who not only works in this life, but even if we die in this life because we follow Jesus, he will raise us up on the other side. The question is, at the base of all this, do we think we deserve more? Do we think we deserve better? That is, in fact, what Israel thought, because that's what God told them. So we went from Psalm 44 to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, but let's go back even farther to the Old Testament, to Leviticus. After God rescued Israel out of Egypt, and before God brought them into the Promised Land, God made a covenant with them, and that covenant is basically an agreement between God and Israel. I saved you from Egypt, says God, Here's what it's going to mean to be my people. You're already saved. Here's what it means to live for me. That's what all the laws in the Old Testament are about. 
And part of this covenant came with what are called blessings for obedience and curses for disobedience. Right? There was essentially in the Old Testament covenant over, under Moses an iron law between if you're faithful to God, things will go well for you. If you are unfaithful to God, things will very much not go well for you. And all the things that the psalmist has just described in Psalm 44 are things that are talked about in Leviticus. If Leviticus 26, if the people of Israel are unfaithful to the covenant, we read in verse 17, this is Leviticus 26, verse 17, I, God, will set my face against you, and you shall be struck down before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. Look at verse 25. And I will bring a sword upon you and shall execute vengeance for the covenant. If you gather within your cities, I will send pestilence among you and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. Look at verse 33. And I will scatter you among the nations and I will unsheathe the sword against you and your land shall be desolation, and your city shall be a waste. This is exactly what the psalmist is complaining about in Psalm 44. Go back to Psalm 44, right? You have not gone out with our armies. We have turned back from the foe. You made us sheep to the slaughters. Look at verse 11. You have scattered us among the nations. Exactly what God said would happen in Leviticus 26, long ago. So the question the psalmist is wrestling with right now and it's a question that many of us wrestle with in a different kind of way. Did we do something wrong? Are we experiencing this suffering, this hardship, because we've been unfaithful? Do we deserve this? Or do we deserve better? So the starting point, I said at the beginning, that this psalm will take us from a a journey, right? And we'll see this journey through the whole scripture, and it's the journey of our lives and how we respond to suffering. The starting point here is the assumption that God owes us. God owes me. I've been faithful, so God owes me better. Or I've been unfaithful, so I deserve what I'm getting. The starting point, many of us feel, I'm not saying this is right, but many of us feel that God owes me. And this is where the psalmist begins. What we see, though, is that in lots of places in Scripture, this iron law is questioned, right? So in Leviticus, there's this idea, Israelites hold this idea that if you're faithful, you're rewarded. If you're unfaithful, you're punished. But other parts in the Old Testament question this, right? Think of the book of Job. If you're familiar with the book of Job, it's a book that's all about this one man named Job who has done nothing wrong. He is entirely innocent. He is righteous. He is good and he is faithful. And yet he suffers terribly. He loses wife, children, possessions, property, even his health. And the whole book of Job is all about him and his friends questioning, did Job do something wrong? Is God wrong? Right? They're questioning this iron law between your behavior and the consequences. And there are psalms that question this too. And it turns out, as we keep reading, that that's exactly what this psalm does. Look at this very next verse, verse 17. All of this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you, and we have not been false to your covenant. There are other psalms, right, that might say, you know, all this is happening and we're sorry because we sinned and we were unfaithful. That's not what this psalm does. The psalmist here knows that he and his whole nation have been faithful. And that's why this is all a problem. Right? Because the rule goes, if I'm faithful, this kind of thing should not happen. Many of us sometimes think, I've been faithful to God. Why is all this hardship happening? Verse 18, our hearts have not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. 
Yet you have broken us in the place of the jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread our hands out to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Do you ever feel like a sheep just lining up for the slaughter? You didn't do anything to deserve it, and maybe it seems like God just has turned his back and doesn't even care. You're just one more sheep, right, lined up for the slaughter, a lemming ready to be pushed off the cliff. Are we just sheep for the slaughter? Is the suffering meaningless? We didn't deserve it. And is it inevitable? What we find as the Old Testament progresses, right, we went backwards to Leviticus. If we move forward in the Old Testament, we find that God has other plans in mind. See, the people of Israel, we've just read in verse 11, have been scattered among the nations, right? They've been exiled, they're in captivity in Babylon. And God reveals something to a prophet named Isaiah about this time when the people of Israel are in captivity in Babylon, rejected and exiled. We read about, in Isaiah, a servant whom God will raise up. Isaiah has four songs about this servant, and the last one is found in Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, God tells Isaiah that one day, when the people are captive in Babylon, exiled, suffering, scattered among the nations, God will raise up a servant. In Isaiah 53, we read, the whole chapter is worth reading, but we'll just read a few verses. We read in verse 3, this servant is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. That means we didn't really think much of him. We didn't think highly of him. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. That means, just like Leviticus 26 and most of the rest of the Mosaic Covenant, we thought he was suffering because he did something wrong, and he deserved it, and so God was smiting him. But here is the crazy, mind-bending part. This is where the journey of how we respond to suffering starts to change. God had other things in mind for this servant. Read in verse 5. Notice the, the, the contrast, the tension here. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement or the torture that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. You see how that's different? He's not suffering because he did anything wrong. His suffering is redemptive. His suffering is for the benefit of somebody else. His suffering is being used by God in the mission and purposes and plans of God for the benefit of somebody else, not because he did anything wrong. We ended Psalm 44 asking, are we just sheep to be slaughtered? Well, look at the next verse in Isaiah 53, verse 6. We're not sheep to be slaughtered. We are sheep that have gone astray. But who is the servant? Look at verse 7. He, he is like a lamb or a sheep being led to the slaughter. This servant is a sheep for the slaughter, not because he did anything wrong, but for the sake of somebody else. 
many of you will have picked up by now that this is a prophecy about Jesus. Jesus is the suffering servant who came to suffer not because he did anything wrong, but for the sake of you and me and all of God's children. And sure enough, this is the pattern that we see in the Gospels when Jesus comes to earth, right? He suffered terribly. His best friend betrayed him, right? He was poor and relatively homeless for a lot of the time. He didn't have a whole lot of money. He didn't live in a palace. He was a king, but he didn't live like a king. And then he was executed, <laughs> publicly shamed, right? They mocked him, taunted him, reviled him. You think you're a king? Here's your robe. Start ruling. Do something about it. You said angels would come and rescue you? Do it. Right? They're mocking him. He is ashamed publicly. But all of that was for us, not because he did anything wrong. And so we see that the place of suffering in the Christian life starts to change. It's not because we did anything wrong necessarily. It can actually be a redemptive part of God's work in our lives. Maybe even for the benefit of somebody else around us. And what's crazy about Jesus' life is he is then a model for every one of us, isn't he? You see, Jesus, when he had hardship and suffering, he didn't think, wait, did I do something wrong to deserve this? He also didn't, he wasn't surprised. He didn't think, I followed God so that life would be easy and comfortable and simple, and I could be successful and people would like me, and everything would go well for me, right? He wasn't surprised. When we come to Jesus, we find that suffering becomes a normal part of life, a usual, common, expected part of life, right? And he is a model for the rest of us. And so the Apostle Paul, after him, follows this model. Jesus said, pick up your cross and follow me. We have crosses everywhere as a nice kind of symbol for our faith. Put it in rainbow colors and make it look pretty, but it's an execution device. This is like Jesus saying, pick up your electric chair and follow me. Anybody that wants to come after Jesus picks up an execution device. So Jesus is our model, but we find that suffering is usual and common and normal. The question then becomes, how do we deal with it? <laughs> if hardship and trial is to be expected in the Christian life, I mean, let's be honest, suffering sucks. <laughs> How do we deal with it? How do we get through it? How do we survive? When I got to that last verse that we just read in Psalm 22, some, some bells started to ring in my head. Yet for your, verse 22, yet for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Does that sound familiar to any of you? It sounded familiar to me. I started reading it and I was, wait, I've heard this before. Where have I heard this? It turns out that I've heard this and you've heard this from Romans chapter 8. The Apostle Paul followed the model of Jesus and lived a life full of hardship and suffering and persecution and trial, and he just knew that was normal. It was not unexpected. And he writes in chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, about how to deal with it. Romans chapter 8 is, it's known, it's famous because it's a chapter about love. But the starting point is it's a chapter about suffering. So turn with me to Romans chapter 8, and we'll see how God thinks through the Apostle Paul. We deal with suffering if it's a normal part of the Christian life. Romans chapter 8, look at verse 18. Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What is this glory? In part, it is certainly the glory of God himself. But as we read through the chapter, we find it is also 
the glory that God imparts to us as he makes us more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. We read some more about it in verse 28, which was coincidentally read earlier. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are according to for those who are called according to his purpose. What is this good? And what is this purpose? Is it comfort and ease and success in life? No. Keep reading. Verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The good that God works all things for in our life is making us more like Jesus. To be conformed to the image of his son. That's the good that God works all things for, to make you more like Jesus, more full of love, more full of life, more full of faith, more full of joy despite our circumstances, more willing to suffer on behalf of others. As we go on, that's when Paul starts talking about how we deal with the suffering throughout life. We cling to the love of God. He says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, notice this is all hardship, suffering language, right? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword? And here's where it is. As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. When I realized this, my mind was blown. (laughs) Here I'd been reading Psalm 44, right? It was more or less random. I just picked it because it was after Psalm 43. (laughs) I'd been reading Psalm 44, and I'd been thinking about how, what is the place of suffering in the Christian life, right? It goes from God owes us to being a redemptive part of God's mission in the world and in our life, a place where God does his best work in us, We read that in Isaiah 53, and then we see that in the life of Jesus, and then the Apostle Paul lives it out, and we are all called to follow it. And then in this pinnacle chapter of the Bible, where Paul talks about suffering and about how to deal with it, he goes back to that very psalm that I just happened by coincidence to be reading earlier, and he quotes it. Are we just sheep to be slaughtered? And then look at the very next word. No. Are we sheep to be slaughtered? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Are we sheep to be slaughtered? Is the suffering meaningless and God's forgotten about us and doesn't care and it doesn't matter if we're faithful or not? We're just lemmings to be pushed off the cliff? No. In all these things, victory. Not in spite of all these things. Not instead of all these things. Not because we've been rescued from the hardship then. Not around, not behind, not over. In all these things, we are conquerors. We prevail completely. We are victorious. It is in the midst of the suffering and the hardship that God does his best work in us, where we cling to this love of God from which we cannot be separated even by the worst kinds of suffering. We cling to this love, and God shapes us into the image of his Son in it all. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. What is the place of suffering in the Christian life, and how do we deal with it? We move from God owes me to God loves me. We move from God owes me, I deserve better, to this is normal for being a Christian. And God loves me. And in the very midst 
of all of these detours and challenges and unexpected surprises that I don't want, God loves me so much that he is shaping in me the very character of God to conform me to the image of his son for when he brings me home. We see in this that we experience the love of God perhaps most profoundly in the hardest parts of life. We experience the powers of God are manifest in our weakness. We want to live resurrection life and victory, but you know what you need before resurrection? A death. It is in our dying that we find life. And so we read, for example, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, this exact thing. Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. That means you and me, our bodies are weak and broken and frail, just like a jar of clay, to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And then look at this, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our bodies. It is this strange and crazy and confusing and mysterious thing that in the midst of death, we are brought into life as we experience the love of God in new ways. And you know what? Our psalm isn't over. And it turns out that this journey from God owes me to God loves me is exactly how the psalm ends as well. Turn back to Psalm 44, verse 23. I said there are two actual prayers in this psalm. The first one was in verse 4, and here's the last bit, verse 23. The psalmist says, wake up. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Get up. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust and our belly clings to the ground. Rise up, come to our help, redeem us. Why? Because you owe us? No. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Rescue us because we know that you love us. So in this psalm, we find the journey that we're all invited to, the journey in suffering from God owes me better to God loves me, even in the midst of it. We've seen in this psalm the movement from remembering the past for the sake of the future, in the first eight verses. In the next section, we saw that things have not gone as expected despite our faithfulness. Verses 9 to 22, things have not gone expected despite the fact that we're faithful. And in these last three verses, we find that the psalmist rests his hope. All of his confidence in his prayer rests on the unshakable fact that God loves him, that God loves this, his people that God loves you, that God loves this people, that no matter what happens, God will work all things for good, in making us more like Jesus. And this journey that we see through the psalm is also the journey of the scriptures, right? We saw it from Leviticus to Job to Isaiah, into the Gospels, into the book of Romans. We are all invited on this journey. I need this reminder that God may ordain setbacks and challenges and detours and hurdles and frustrations and pain and hardship for the sake of my own growth in character and faith and Christ-likeness. My uh, pastor in Wheaton a couple years ago as we were sort of finishing up the PhD program and um, thinking about what was next, he talked to me about what he called the winding path of providence. Right, That God... 
God is sovereign, God will ordain my steps, but those steps are usually not in a straight line <laughs> to the destination that I want it to be. It is a winding path of providence. God is with me and he's with you in that whole winding path. My pastor also reminded me that God often does his best work in the wilderness. Just like God rescued the people of Israel out of Egypt and took them through the wilderness in order to shape them and form them and instruct them in how to be God's people for when they got to the promised land. Just like Jesus spent 40 days and nights in the wilderness being shaped and prepared, molded for ministry. So too with you and I on this winding path of providence, there are many, many detours that take us through long sections of the wilderness. And it is in those sections of the wilderness that God does his best work in us. These past couple years have challenged for me my sense of identity and worth, value, faith. Right? Do I find my worth in the things that I'm able to do or in the things that I have or in what other people think of me? In the house that I do or don't have or the job that I do or don't have or the relationships that I do or don't have? Is that what makes me who I am, or worth something. And all these things God has stripped away from me, false idols, <clears throat> so that I could dwell more deeply in the fact that God loves me. God doesn't owe me, but God loves me. And I hope that for each of us too, this psalm, can be a helpful reminder for us. In the midst of hardship and suffering and trial as we respond, that God doesn't owe us. That hardship is normal. That we've fallen, chosen to follow a God who became a man and took up an execution chair and called us to do the same. But through hell and high water, through death, disease, loss. God is with us. God loves us. And in that very space, we are not sheep for the slaughter. We are conquerors. So my prayer for each of you is that through whatever it is that you are carrying, whatever you brought in in your hardship this morning, that you will experience a new kind, a new sense of God's love. And in that very place, experience victory and life and resurrection you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we confess that we don't want life to be hard. We want life to be comfortable and easy. And in many ways, we do have that. We're thankful. Sometimes it feels like we signed up to follow you so that you would just give us what we wanted, that you owe us. Lord, we confess and we repent of whatever space in which we do that. We confess and repent of those idols which we have set up, which do not hear and do not see, do not talk. They just do exactly what we tell them to do so that we can get what we want. But you, God, you are not an idol. You are a living God. You do see, you do hear, you do talk. You see and you hear all of our hardships, even the injustices which you seek to rescue us out of. Lord, would you help us to not think of our relationship with you as transactional, that as long as we're faithful, you have to be nice to us and give us what we want but that it would be a real relationship, Lord, that we would know deep inside our bones that we are loved by you through the worst things that life can throw at us and that we would remain faithful to you, cling to you, and be made more like your son, that we might grow up into maturity of faith and that would, you would use even our suffering for your good and redemptive purposes, even to bless others, to be a benefit to others, Lord that you in all things would be made much of, that you would be glorified in our weakness, that your power would be made known, 
in our weakness, that your life and resurrection power would be manifest in our dying. God, would you be honored in all things in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise, and take my voice and let me sing. time when God has spoken to us so clearly. Let us lay our burdens before him because he has promised that he will care for us. And those who come with that attitude of burdens and sufferings, let us assure that as we leave this place, God's unfailing love that sustains us. Sometimes we all think that we owe something from God. It's God's business to bless us all the time. Yes, God will bless us. But as we go through the realities of life, He has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Take courage. You have troubles in this world, but I have overcome the world. So let us go this place that as Paul declared that no, in all these things more than we are more than conquerors. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Dear Father, we thank you for the privilege you gave us to come to the throne of your grace through your Son, Jesus Christ. We are grateful to know again that you have loved us eternally and you are willing to send your Son to die on behalf of us. Not because he has done anything wrong, Lord. He died for us. Help us to rest assured in your love. Rest of this week and in our lives, O oh Lord. We don't know what tomorrow's bring, but we know that our life is secured in you who holds the tomorrow's, who loves us so dearly, O oh God. We thank you for Mason and Susie, and we pray your blessings upon them. Continue to use them, bless them, provide for them. We thank you that they set apart their life to serve you, God, we pray that you honor them in this generation like Joshua to lead many, many to the destiny of God. We remember all our dear ones who are not able to make it today. We pray for your blessings upon them. 
those who are struggling and suffering in various ways father we pray that your healing your presence your strength upon their lives oh lord lord this week we pray that in us to love you with all our heart mind soul and strength oh lord lord that 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 be the lifestyle that throughout the week throughout our days oh lord uh, to express the love to one another and also to share the love with this world that any people those who come across our life of oh father we pray for all our children as they go back to school we pray your blessings upon them those who are in college those who are in dorms those who are away from us we remember them again oh god we pray your blessings upon their lives help us again to be faithful to you and help us to represent you well as we leave this place we love you we thank you in your precious name we pray amen let us stand on our feet for the benediction the never failing everlasting unconditional eternal love of our father the sustaining strength and grace of our lord jesus the sweet fellowship of the holy spirit that guides us in all the truth with all of us now and for ever more amen amen god bless you all have a great week the fellowship hall is open you can stay and talk to each other if you need prayer you please come we'll stand here and somebody will be honored to pray with you and pray for you god bless you all